Good morning, beloved. Good morning. Good morning. We are continuing this morning in our sermon series on Psalms. Psalm 119, an acrostic in the original Hebrew language. Each of these eight verse stanzas based upon one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet has taught us something wonderful about the Word of God. So far we have seen the Word of God as blameless, as pure, as something to want, as something we need. We've seen it as that choice in stark contrast to the world. We've seen it as a choice of love, a choice of hope. Today's section, based upon the Hebrew letter Heth, shows us urgency. We have an urgent need. More than the sorrows of our life, the trials we face, the giants that face us down, is deeper, a greater need over and above it all. Last week, we were called to pray for the coming of Christ, the solution to every single problem that ever was or will ever be. Knowing how urgently we need Christ to come, there's only one thing delaying. Only one thing competing with our need to Christ to come is our need to come to Christ. One we urgently must meet, to meet the Lord as our Lord, so that when every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord, it will not be the first time that we are doing it. Turn with me to Psalm 119. That's Psalm 119. This morning, half is verses 57 through 64. The Word of God, beginning in Psalm 119, verse 57. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Verse 57 and 58 says, The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. And that's what it is, beloved. Promise and grace. That's what we are to give our whole heart to. Promise and grace. Our portion, our prize, our promise. We can promise to the God of promises knowing that He is faithful, knowing that He is trustworthy, knowing that He is worthy of the promise of our heart by word, by deed, in love, promise, and grace. These are the tools that enable us to conviction. Something the world sorely lacks, something that we sorely need. After all, what good is an ideology, a religion, politics, worldview, what have you, if there's no call to conviction? A philosophy is worthless if it doesn't change you. A philosophy is completely a waste of time if it doesn't make you want to change. If it's just feeding you your own talking points. That's just you sitting in an empty room, patting yourself on the back for hearing your echo. Whole world shouting today. Whole world shouting. Nobody's listening. People are saying a lot. Cable news, social media, anyone with a phone is a philosopher today. Plenty is being said. Little is worth listening to. And it shows. Because hearts aren't changing. People aren't convicted by the voices of man. We're well entrenched in our own little fiefdoms of philosophy. But there is one who can walk the no man's land between the trenches to make enemies into friends and turn hearts to love. The 2005 World War I film, Joyeux Noel, is based on the true story of the Christmas armistice 
of 1914. Germany and France set aside their political, material, and even military differences, laid down arms. On some sides of the front, the sides enabled one another to simply recover the fallen between them. On others, they sang carols at each other across the divide. And in some parts, they exchanged gifts, rations, well wishes. Some even played soccer on fields they had fired across that morning. What could be a time out between life and death? Life only. Both sides of the conflict, on a grand meta-societal level, recognized the gift of Jesus Christ that night, that day, and that alone was enough to cross the uncrossable. When man by arms or by words could not cross the difference, the gap between the trenches, the love of Christ could. See, the word of God can make bitter enemies into dear friends. And if you don't believe me, just ask every single house church that ever hosted the Apostle Paul. But not just Paul. The poster boy for conviction softening a heart of stone. Not just Manasseh, that wicked king that turned his heart to God, whom we discussed last week. But also Matthew, Zacchaeus, Joseph's brothers, Rahab, Ruth, Samson, Naaman, Nebuchadnezzar, the Samaritan woman at the well. All these and more were touched by the ways of God, turning their lives from the outside in. Calling them, changing them, giving them life through a promise of life. And this is not an exchange. It's not a transaction, no matter how much man would like it to be. The promise of life is God's to give. The response, the grateful joy of God being gracious to you according to his promise is to promise to keep his words. Not to get it, but because you have it. Because you see the precious precepts of God in your hands for the glorious gift they are. Words of life, of providence, of prosperity, of right, even when things aren't right. You see the good gift of God and you cling to it for what it is. The promise is not an exchange because yours in no way a comparable value to his, but rather like a child expressing their joy when their father gives them a puppy. Oh, Father, I promise to keep him and take care of him and, and I'll walk him every day because the child cherishes the gift. The promise comes easily, freely, unnecessarily in words because indeed it will be kept because of love, desire. With all his heart, he is turned to it. And we should hold the word of God, the promise of God, in all our hearts, clutched tightly to our chests as a child does a puppy. With absolute love. No promise necessary. Because the promise is lived. See, when the Jews returned from the exile... The prophet Ezra tells of the reconstruction of the temple. Surrounded by enemies, return from diaspora with what little they have to rebuild ruins. Ezra 3 verses 10 through 13 says, And when the lead builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever for His Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice. When they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. And in this story, 
What a beautiful image. The weeping and the joy mingled. Indistinguishable. One voice of heartfelt emotion. Sorrow for what was lost. Sorrow for the pain of the trial and the memory of the greater glory that once was. Joy of being in the homeland. Joy of getting to worship God rightly. Sacrifice to God for the first time in their lives. With what little they had. And danger encompassing all about. Scoffers and naysayers working a drama of bureaucracy against them. And to be overjoyed. Overwhelmed by the mere opportunity to praise God. To come to worship through a quarantine. Through fear, through people bothered that we would gather in his name and trying to work a travesty of law to prevent us, for us to be here overjoyed, overwhelmed by the mere opportunity to praise God. Amen. Amen. So what are we waiting for? Do not hold back your joy. Do not hold back your promise. What are we waiting for? Psalm 119, verses 60 and 61, it says, When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. What are we waiting for? Don't delay. Act now. Supplies are running out. The infomercial always seems to urge this, don't they? Long before we invented the recent term FOMO, fear of missing out, Advertisers have been capitalizing on the concept of human impatience, on the need to respond immediately lest we lose the opportunity to at all. But where is this urge, this urgency, when it comes to God's call? After the response is good, with the ears to hear and the eyes to see, we see the truth. We want to be set free. We want Jesus. Choose Jesus just when it'll be convenient. When it will fit to our schedule best. You see it's not always a struggle between the world and the word. Sometimes we want it. We just want it tomorrow. I'll obey you Lord. But before I do. Famously Constantine the Roman emperor that would be. He was given a dream of victory over his rivals. For the throne of Rome under the symbol of Christ. Changing his banners for the battle, he discovered that day, Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. And in that victory, using this newly consolidated power over his empire, he takes that outcast, that persecuted faith of a few, and he makes it the official religion of Rome. He organizes a council of bishops to canonize the books. He marches his army through the river to baptize them. And yet... Infamously, Constantine does not receive baptism himself until on his deathbed. Only then, joining the Christian religion that had prospered him, and he in turn had encouraged to prosper. Constantine knew the right answer. God had visited him mightily in his life and his life's work. He knew it was good. He spent all his political collateral to elevate Christendom in his society, but still... He foolishly played it fast and loose with his own faith until the last day. When caught between the devil and the divine, between Satan and sainthood, between Lucifer and the Lord, between El Diablo and Elohim, why wait at all? What's there to wait on? You're sitting nothing out. You think you're sitting on the fence. But you're still in the uncontested territory of the defeated devil. Now sometimes people will set out an engagement waiting to see how the wind will blow. Who will come out on top before they pick a side. Christ has already won. Christ has won definitively, exclusively, irreversibly. Don't let the devil's propaganda arm trick you otherwise. Don't stand with the loser. Pick victory. Pick life. Pick Christ and get off that picket fence you're sitting on because staying in death another day will do you no good. No good at all. Now, I've mentioned this before in previous sermons, but the secular song, Jesus Wrote a Blank Check by the band Cake, it is a phenomenally accurate illustration of the folly of man. 
Its lyrics sing in the chorus, Jesus wrote a blank check, one I haven't cashed quite yet. I hope I've got a little more time. I hope it's not the end of the line. Yeah, Jesus wrote a blank check, one I haven't cashed yet. The world is full of people foolishly waiting to cash Christ's check of salvation. People holding an impossible debt of sin and waiting, waiting to receive the freedom of forgiveness because, Lord, I'll get right with you tomorrow. And tomorrow becomes tomorrow's tomorrow. Always tomorrow. So we run out of tomorrows on a today we don't see coming. Why would you gamble with eternity? There's no gain in it. The risk reward is too vast to play with, and yet we still do. We play with our eternity until that day we finally realize our mortality. Only when we realize that death is real, that it awaits us. Only when we stare into that eternity stretching out before us do we finally take seriously our need of life. You see, someone that thinks they're never going to die is never going to consider what happens to them after. But Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ... Having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Don't delay. Act now. Supplies of your tomorrows are running out fast. Now, Brother Robert is fond of saying we have no guarantee of tomorrow. Today is all the grace we know. So use it to choose it. Choose grace while you can, while the grace of God's breath is in your lungs and it still gives you voice enough to cry out for the words of life. Because what will you do if tomorrow never comes? Beloved, now I'm going to talk about those that have accepted the Lord. You aren't waiting. You aren't delaying. But beloved, I ask you, are you dragging your heels to follow you? Is it like pulling teeth now that you've come to Christ to keep on coming on? You see, he's still calling. He never stops calling, never stops calling us to move, to change, to grow, to come. While he's calling you, are you standing still? We can't just stand in the grace of our Savior because he is calling us to walk by that grace in obedience to our Lord. Matthew 8, verses 21 and 22. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Now here a man knew him to be right. He was in the fold, okay? A disciple, though not one of the twelve, a follower already of Jesus. And Jesus was ready to go. The disciple was ready to go if. I'll follow you, Lord. I'll follow you with all my heart tomorrow. God doesn't want tomorrow. God wants our hearts right now. All of it. Every bit. Who am I that you should be mindful of me? Beloved, not only does he know you, he wants you, and he desires you fully. What a, a precious gift it is. That God wants to keep us. Doesn't want to share us with the world, but keep us all to Him. He wants you today. Every today. So there's no more tomorrows. He wants you every today until there's only one continual eternal today. He wants you today. So when God calls us to step up, that doesn't mean when we get around to it. When God wants us to go, that doesn't mean when we've got nothing else to do. When God wants us to serve, we serve. When God calls, He is calling now. Yet sadly, His church is full of spiritual procrastination that doesn't know what life could be 
as we're dragging our heels, slowing down on God's path for us. Stand-up comedian Brian Regan joked, putting off a trip to the eye doctor is silly, saying, how could instantly improved vision not be at the top of your to-do list? And we settle for less. We're complacent and compromised. You see, we don't know how bad our vision is until we go to the eye doctor. We think everything is fine until the optometrist shows us what our vision could be. And Judges 17.6 says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See, when we drag our heels on the decision to accept Christ, or as believers, drag our heels on the decision to serve Christ and obey Him more, it's because we are looking with impaired vision instead of the 2020 clarity of Christ. We suffer from spiritual procrastination. Now, Cake's song, it concludes with the lines, Still I build my towers high. I watch them pierce the blue, blue sky. Still I wallow in the mire. Still I burn this earth in fire. Now, this is a clear allusion to the Tower of Babel, that gaggle of men doing what was right in their own eyes, trying to achieve the glory of the heavens on their own terms, by their own means instead of God's. And let that linger in your mind. Still I burn this earthly fire. That is why we procrastinate. Foolish earth and fire. Works of the world. What's right in our own eyes. But once I was blind. Now I see. Now I see. No longer with scales on my eyes, not even through a scanner darkly, when I see with the crystal clarity of God's own eyes, I am no longer afraid of what I'll see. The things we tolerated being intolerable, the things we overlooked now beacons for prayer, the things we looked away from being inescapable magnets to our eyes, drawing our hearts and hands to change the world for the better. The blind can't change the world. But with God's eyes, when I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. Now a short list of dangerous prayers. Pray for patience. Pray for humility. Pray for self-awareness. And that prayer for self-awareness is the most dangerous prayer on that list. See, asking God to make abundantly clear the difference between our self-image and His standard. Standing on the one and requiring conviction to step toward the other. And I think that's the reason folk delay. I think that's the reason we're afraid to know. Afraid to go. But we are afraid of the one thing we should be assured of. It's not by my power that I walk the gap between my failings and my faith. That's what Christ is for. It is not my strength, my wit, my will that leaves the world behind to answer the call. That's what the Spirit is for. It is not my wisdom that will figure it out. It is not my opinion that matters. It is not what I think is best that I am going to. That's what the Father is for. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. It's the testimonies of the truth of God, the word of God, the words of life that gives me strength, gives me surety of the right direction, conviction of my need to go, and the gentle, loving invitation of God's love to hasten my feet along his path towards his commandments. And it's not even that I do my part and God will do the rest. Because that is emphasizing my part way, way, way too much. It's just a little bitty thing what I do. It's that I give God my heart and He'll take it. It's that simple. I give God my heart and He'll do something splendiferous with it. So that once we behold the splendor of the King, we get to become the splendor of the King. A living testimony of the awesome grace of God. Why would we want to put that off till tomorrow? 
Why would we want to wait to be part of the glory of God? Don't delay. Act now. Whenever now is. If it's Sunday morning, say, here I am, Lord. If it's Tuesday that you're watching this, say, send me. And if you're watching this in the middle of the night, then rise up and praise Him. Don't delay. Don't wait till tomorrow. Start today. Start tonight. Start now. Amen. The psalmist concludes for us this morning with verses 62 through 64 saying, At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Now, we read midnight, that blinking 12.00 on the clock, as the very start of the day. And we see this as the psalmist telling us to begin with the very technical start of the day, to pick today, to give your heart over to God's word today. But in the Hebrew world, they rather sensibly begin the day with sun up. Six o'clock, their first hour. So instead, we should read verse 62 with the, the intense urgency of starting before the start of the day. I've been telling you not to delay, to pick today. And here the psalmist is actually exhorting you to pick today so hard that you choose yesterday to pick him. You start six hours before today to say, today I'm yours, Lord. See, Nathan Hale's famous last words were, I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Our one regret should be that I want to give you so much of my today, I wish I could have started yesterday. Had I a flux capacitor, I'd give you my heart today all the sooner, Lord. That is how much I want to not delay. How much I want to be yours. How much I want to dive deep into the family and heart of God. See, verse 63 says, I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. Beloved, the promise of God, the grace of God is that we don't just gain a father in heaven. We gain brothers and sisters in this world, spiritual siblings we need as accountability partners, that we need to sharpen one another's iron, that we need to help keep us convicted to walk the path of his commandments. We get encouragement in our family and we get to encourage one another to stop looking at the things of this world, to stop looking at what is wrong, to stop looking at what is right in the individual eyes of each and every one of us and instead fix our eyes upon the hills where our help comes from. Fix our eyes on the wooden cross on the hill of Golgotha where our salvation comes. Fix our eyes on the city on the hill where Christ will come again. Amen. Fix our eyes on Jesus and see that this world it is full of His steadfast love. For everyone who keeps His precepts Every one of those hearts beating for Christ, it is bearing His steadfast love in this world. As we look to each and every one of us, we get to see the steadfast love of Christ filling this place, filling this town, pouring out into this world. His steadfast love endures forever. And because it does, these hearts beating for him, beating that steadfast love, will endure forever also. Those hearts filled with his life, filled with the self-awareness, not focused on our failings, not burdened by our problems, not feeding our doubts, is fixed on his grace given, unburdened by his solution, feeding our hope and giving wings to our faith. Those hearts are now the testimonies, the living testimonies of the living God. And behold, what God has done for you, what God has done for me, what God has done for us, forging in us with him for all eternity. Why would you wait to join that? Beloved, if you want to vanquish the cold hearts of the world, 
You want to overturn the rise of fear and stem the tide of hatred? Then get up off of that fence and treat his favor with all your heart. Take him as your portion and your prize. And when he calls, know that you know he has called you to jump. So you ask how high, how high do you want to take me, Lord? Because I'm going on this journey and I promise I will keep your word. Because I, I finally stopped being afraid. Stop dragging my feet. Stop doubting the God that calls me. Stop doubting that he can take me there. Because I trust in you, Lord. Show me your ways. I trust in you, Lord. To be enough. To be my everything. I trust in you, Lord. That is why I will delay no more. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for your promise and your grace. We thank you that you are good, mightily good. We thank you, Lord, that you are so much better than whatever I have planned. We thank you, Lord, that as you promised to walk side by side with me, that your rod and your staff comfort me through all the trials and travails of this world, that you promised, Lord, to never leave nor forsake me, that you promised, Lord, that your eternity with me starts today. So open my eyes, Lord. Fix my vision, Lord. That I stop foolishly looking at my hands, my will, my plans, my today. And Lord, let me give it to you. And see what your today looks like. See what your forever tomorrow looks like. See what you can do with my heart. Because Lord, we need to trust you. Lord, we need to stop stopping you from using us mightily in this world. We look around all over and we see problems, Lord, and we try and find solutions. You're right there. You are right here. You have never left. You are right here, Holy Spirit. Holding peace, holding joy, holding love, holding forgiveness, holding justice, holding grace, holding tomorrow in your hands. We need to stop trying to figure it out. We need to stop waiting for someone else to stand up and do something. And we need to stare in the mirror, Lord. Stare in the mirror and dare ourselves to pick our feet up off the ground and step forward. We need to dare ourselves, Lord, to let you move us where you want us to go how you want us to get there, when you want us to arrive, we have to dare ourselves, Lord, to really trust you and let you use us for what you have planned today. Then, Lord, then we will see something glorious. In Jesus' name, Lord, show us something glorious.